Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this season. Thank you for what it means to our church and to our community. That we celebrate you coming down. Emmanuel, God with us. God, be here now. Come into our midst. Fall afresh upon us that we might leave changed. And that the way that we see others will come closer to your heart. And that you will be the lens through which we view the world. God, we leave that in your hands. And we look forward to seeing you soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning, but just kind of a broad view of where we're headed in the the next three weeks today included. Matthew chapter 7 is the applied theology of Matthew chapter 5 and 6. Jesus says, I've given you all of the things. Now, here's how you can apply the Sermon on the Mount to others, to me, and to yourself. And today we're looking directly at the relationship that we have with others. And it begins, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. I'll put it up on the screen for you here, following along wherever you're at. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. And verse 2. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus doesn't mince words here. There isn't any poetic dialogue going on here. He is very straight and to the point because he does not want us to miss what he's getting at. The measure you use will be used against you. Remember, don't judge. It's going to come back towards you. There's the old saying that those who live in glass, glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So your house come crumbling down around you. And we have to note very carefully that Jesus here is talking about a judgment of condemnation, not a judgment of discernment, right? We are people who judge. We're judgy people in the very negative sense of the term and in the very positive sense of the term. The way we judge the world helps us navigate who we trust, what we trust, and where we go. When you came in this morning, you did not do an an inspection of this building to see, will the roof be held up over my head as I enter in? You gleefully waltzed into the lobby, welcoming others, others welcoming you. Yeah, the very pew you're sitting on, you didn't look underneath this morning. Could have gone and taken all the bolts out. We're all like sliding all over the place. No, right? You trust the people who built this building, those who manage this place to say, they're going to provide a space and a center of worship that is conducive for me to connect with God, and I'm not going to have to worry about my safety when I walk into the building. Discernment is good. Condemnation is really bad. And Paul illustrates this in Romans chapters 1 and 2. He'll open up Romans chapter 1, and he's talking about the Gentiles. And he's saying how they do all kinds of nasty, gross things, and they're they're evil, and they're licentious. And and he's just, he's going in, and he lists them off. And he says they murder, and they envy, and they quarrel, and they deceive, and they gossip. And and Paul's writing to the Jews in Rome, and the Jews, I imagine, as that letter is being read, is like, yeah, amen. The Gentiles are evil. Man, look at them and what they do. Ah, we could never be like them. And Paul turns it on the head. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, he puts it this way. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the very same thing. kind of sat back a little bit. Romans 2 will go on and Paul breaks down about how they think that they're keeping the law so well. He says, you're not getting at the heart of what the Sermon on the Mount is really about. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 124, Ellen White writes it this way. In condemning others, they are passing sentence upon themselves and God declares that this sentence is just. He accepts their own verdict against themselves. Ouch right? This is, this is court language. This is judge and juror language. She's saying, hey, when, when you say, this is how I'm going to see the world and hold somebody else to that paradigm, God says, well, that looks like it's good enough for me, so I'm going to hold it to you as well. The metric, we must be careful, the metric that we use, we can set up a metric for how others can be judged and look at their, their actions in a particular way and think certain thoughts about them and condemn them for what they're doing. 
But God says in the same way that you're looking at another son or daughter of mine, in that way, I'm going to look at you. So where do we go from here? Right? This is kind of a heavy message. It's kind of like, what are we doing talking about this during Christmas? It's December, right? God, Emmanuel, we're going to get there. Jesus continues on, Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, and he uses the, the, the age-old known proverb about the, the speck and the plank. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Verse 4. Can we go to verse 4? Yeah, there we go. Uh, I messed up the slides for you, Jess. My bad. Here we go. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? And verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus breaks this down for us. This is how this interaction is going to go. You go around looking for specks in people's eyes. You don't realize that there's a plank over your own. You see, judging others makes us blind. It's like walking around and saying, like, yeah, you need to go over there and do that thing and go, to, you know, covering my eyes here. And, like, it does, I can't see what's going on. Jesus says that plank has to be removed from your eyes in order for you to be of assistance to someone else. I like how Dallas Willard puts it in The Divine Conspiracy. He says, we cannot see clearly how to assist our brother because we cannot see our brother or our sister. That plank in the eye goes over and, it, and it, it, it takes away the context. We're not able to truly see and empathize with someone else because we are blinded to our own insecurities and the things that we struggle with. You see, judging others makes us think too much of ourselves. It says, how can you go to somebody else expecting to pull that speck out of their eye while you've got the plank in front of your own? Sometimes we have a sense of self-righteousness, an acute case of better-than-them-itis. The tribalism that we see in our country, in our world, that fosters a sense of us versus them. And we can see it played out particularly in the political and ideological realm, the left versus the right and the red versus the blue. May I not say anything against either. Somebody might assume something about me in a particular way. And we go into our, our, our little posse and, and we, we get together with our group and yeah, like strength in numbers. But Jesus says, how can you expect to help somebody else if you don't first work out the stuff inside of here with me first? That's Matthew 5 and 6, working this out in here. And Jesus says, until you've worked this out here inside with me, you're not ready for Matthew chapter 7. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, again, page 128, puts it this way. There can be no spirit of criticism or self-exaltation on the part of those who walk in the shadow of Calvary's cross. It's not you versus me. It's not left versus right. It's not red versus blue. We are all together in Christ. And I cannot carry a spirit of criticism and self-exaltation if I am walking under the shadow of Calvary's cross. Those two views are completely incompatible because the grace and the love of Jesus will transform our hearts. And if I speak out to someone with criticism, raising myself up to beat them down, that is not of the spirit of Jesus. Yeah, we have to have discernment. Yeah, we got to call each other out in love, right? But it's in love that's important. And finally, Jesus will tell us that judging others disorders our hearts. He says, your heart is disordered because you're first going and trying to pull the speck out of somebody else's eye before you take the plank out of your own. It makes us go speck hunting before we go log extracting. And how often do we want to be the general manager of the universe, right? I have to resign that position every morning when I wake up because we carry a lot on our shoulders, right? Right? There's a lot going on in our lives, and if I can only get this person to talk to that person, if I could figure out this money situation, figure out first how I got into school, and maybe if I can get out of it, what, whatever it might be. Sometimes our hearts are out of disorder, and we think we know exactly what is needed to be done from here on out. God says, no, 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 come to me. Let me transform your heart. God, I want, God says to us, I want you to resign daily of being general manager of the universe. If only you will, then my love will show through you. 
And here's the beauty of where the Christmas story invades the Sermon on the Mount. And planned this series out a couple of months ago, not knowing the twists and turns that it would take, and said, hey, let's, let's go right on up to Christmas, see what connections we can make. And here's, here's the beauty of this story. We sang it a moment ago, Emmanuel, God with us. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus says unequivocally, therefore there is now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Jesus, the one who's asking us not to pass judgment on someone else, says there is no judgment found in me, a judgment of condemnation. You are accepted in my sight. It's the oft-quoted verse, John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the story of the manger. That's the story of the baby Jesus coming to this world, taking on the robe of humanity, And saying, I'm here not to judge and not to condemn, but to love. Because there's a Father that loves you so much that he's sending me so that I can tell you about him and this wonderful, beautiful plan of salvation that we figured out because I love you so much. And yet too often in our lives, we'll take a look at other people by how what they what they wear, who they like, who they love, their orientation, their skin their gender, and make assumptions about them instead of saying, hey, I know a God of love, and I want to introduce you to that God of love, and I'm going to do that through living my life in a loving way, not passing condemnation or judgment upon anyone else, but saying there's a God who loves, and he's going to make up the difference, whatever that difference may be. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing again, page 126. Christ does not drive us, but draws men unto him. The only compulsion which he employs is the constraint of love. It's the only way. And Jesus will say in John chapter 12, verse 32, he says, if, if I, if, if me, if I'm the one, the one lifted up, will draw, and if I'm lifted up, if I'm the one that's put up before everything else, I will draw all men and women, humankind towards me. So I would invite you this morning, under the bidding of Jesus, who says, do not judge, I would invite you to take a different path, to take that non-judgmental way, the way that sets aside any type of condemnation or contempt for someone else, for someone else, and to singularly lift up in your life the name and the person of Jesus Christ. If we as a community will singularly lift up the name and the person of Jesus Christ, we won't have enough room in this building for everyone to be a part of what's going on. But it takes you and it takes me on an everyday basis choosing not to judge with condemnation, but to bring a sense of love to the relationships that we walk in on a daily basis. So, How do you see others? Through a lens of love or a lens of condemnation? Jesus, Jesus chose love. And may Jesus, his example, his kingdom, and his love be our answer.